Maybe you and your supervisor don't really know each other. Maybe you don't have the conversation and the only time that you talk to that person is when you've done something wrong or you, you haven't met your KPIs or you haven't fulfilled whatever your expectation was. So then they're coming to you to talk to you about all of the negative things versus, hey, like you did a great job like hitting your sales this week or great try on this. I know that we coached about X, Y, and Z last week and I see that you are really trying to improve. Amazing. And so it's just really having those, those connections. But I always say connection happens in the hallway. So you can tell by how people walk. If, if somebody's walking by with their head down, maybe looking at their phone, not paying attention to anybody walking by, that's a good indication that there's not much connection going on in your building. Welcome to Stress-Free Solutions with Sarah. I'm your host, Sarah Elise, a stress management and fitness coach advocating the world to trust their gut more often. I discuss various ways to manage stress and share personal stories of guest experts who have gone through the same stressors as all of you at home. Hey there, super moms of the universe. Let's play a game called hide and seek. No, not with your kids or that mysteriously vanishing left sock. It's time to seek out you in the everyday hide and seek of life. Introducing Mastering the Soul System, a 12-week journey to reclaim your time and energy. This course is your gateway to finding balance, energy, and joy in every aspect of your bustling life. Picture this, 12 weeks where the words mom and mayhem don't always go together. Rediscover yourself with every breath in our soulful mind weeks. Sing out loud in the shower or car, off key is absolutely fine, and dance during our soulful body sessions and embrace the quiet whispers of your heart in our soulful spirit adventures. It's about time your spirit got a front row seat, don't you think? Join us on this journey. Embrace the harmony between being a dedicated mom and your personal aspirations. Mastering the soul system, because darling, in the noise, find your silence. And maybe, just maybe, a bit of that elusive thing called me time. You deserve to thrive, not just survive. So come on, slide into our world at www.livewellenhanceyou.com slash soul system. Your journey back to you starts now. Alexis Carpenter, a seasoned culture consultant, empowers organizations to prepare for layoffs, onboard talent, and develop high-performing teams with a laser focus on increasing revenue, retention, and satisfaction. Alexis's journey to becoming a culture consultant stems from her own experience of an abrupt corporate exit due to workforce reductions. This personal encounter fuels her passion for teaching ethical layoff strategies under pressure and proactive disaster avoidance plans. With over 15 years of corporate experience, she has masterfully onboarded thousands of employees and compassionately offboarded approximately 500 individuals. Her notable achievements include orchestrating the dissolution of corporate location in Vermont, where she ensured personalized exit plans for 150 employees, ranging from career transitions to remote work adaptations. Her expertise is backed by certifications in John C. Maxwell's JMT team coaching, speaking, teaching, and training, along with qualifications in trauma and recovery coaching, meditation, and more. Alexis has been featured in Claim Your Worth Digital Magazine, the Ford Female Blog, and the Claim Your Network Agency Speaker Panel. Recognized as a pivotal business figure by forward female and Vermont womenpreneurs, her insights have enlightened audiences at the fifth annual Vermont Womenpreneurs Summit and beyond, including live trainings and summits like the Virtual Moneymaker Summit with Maria Went and Super Connector Media Mastermind events. I am so pumped for you guys to get to know Alexis. We share such a love for corporate wellness and just corporate culture in general. So 
Thank you so much for being here. I'm truly excited for today. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Me too. I feel like we have been waiting so long to do this together. So I'm so excited. Oh, I want to first find out like that time when you knew I need to not only start talking more to companies about how to have a little bit more love or give a little bit more love to their employees by compassionately letting go. That's not a job that <laughs> a lot of people want to do. Let's face it. What was that time where you're like, oh, I, I think I would be the best person for this job? Yeah. Yeah. So it's really not like the standard, but I, it really did happen when I had to close down one of our locations and what I had so much anxiety, right? Like this, that was a lot of weight to put on one person, like one executive to carry the weight for an entire location of employees. And so I was like, how can I do this in a way that's not going to leave the stress on them? They're not going to feel the the burden. They're not going to have to worry about it when they go home. Like, how can I carry that for them? And so I was like, okay, what if I prepare them for the interview? What if I prepare them with their resume? Because some of them were there for 10 years, right? People aren't touching their resume it, it, when they're secure in their job. And it really did come from this other place. And then when I got laid off, it was like night and day, a completely different scenario. And I was like, okay, we can really do better. Like how much better? Okay. So right, this scenario where you're sitting there with somebody that you've worked with for 12 years and they're like, okay, here's your severance package. You're let go. That doesn't feel good. That's just, that, that feels so nope. terrible inside. But then think of this, like all year long, every quarter you're sitting there Every employee in the building is updating and refreshing their resume. You're doing mock interviews. So people are preparing. You're helping your employees build their network while you're also sim simultaneously doing the same thing. And then like you're communicating this. Maybe the message is, as everybody knows in like in today's industry, we have to do layoffs sometimes. And so what we want to do is prepare you if that was ever to happen, because the last thing that we want is for you to be blindsided and not have a plan for you and your family to be financially stable, right? Now that I feel like is a very easy conversation to have, but what we, what I've noticed is like the stopping point is when they're like, but if I communicate that, what if people leave? And my rebuttal to that is you have to make people leave anyway. So wouldn't you rather them be prepared and the mm. people that are just genuinely, I can't handle that stress leave. And then you prepare the other ones and then you have people ready to go and ready to transition. And it doesn't feel as negative and it doesn't feel as bad. And then we are still in good standing, right? Like I'm still going to talk to people about how my employer, I knew I could trust them. I felt safe with them. They helped me find this next position. They did everything in their power to make sure everything was alleviated off of my shoulders and helped me get into this next phase of my career such a different feeling. Totally. And so why not? And so then I just became super fueled. Like, how can I like educate people? How can I get these organizations to see that when you start acting proactive versus reactive, it's such a, everything changes. It really does. So when you're chatting with a company for the first time, what are the initial questions that you ask them to find out the pain points, the problems, what's really going on? Yeah. First, I ask them, what are your attrition rates? Do you see a lot of turnover in your organization? If that answer is yes, then I'm like, okay, great. We have a communication barrier. Most likely we have a connection barrier. And then I'll ask, what does your revenue look like? Is it fluctuating up and down month to month? Are you increasing month to month or are you decreasing? And if, again, if that answer is yes or no, then if they say yes, it's going down or it's fluctuating, then I'm like, okay, then we have maybe a client satisfaction issue, right? Like your clients aren't as satisfied, your, their customers aren't getting served by your people the way that they should be. So okay. again, there's that communication barrier. So now I know, okay, out of five, now we've got two out of two out of five that are in communication. And then maybe the next thing is, do you, are you able to retain your clients long-term? Do you see them staying with you? Do they extend their contracts? Do they refer people to you? Or do you see them like pretty much biting at the bit to get out after that six month contract or that year contract? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so if the answer is yes, they like, they typically don't resign. Then I'm like, okay, great. You're one, your people aren't effectively servicing their clients that they need you to do or the job that they're hired you to do, or your communication with them is off. And so that's usually the indicator. And the only way for me to then move forward is usually to start with an employee engagement survey. So I can get the the leader's feedback, but they're not the ones on the front line. They're not the ones impacted by the day-to-day. They're not feeling that. They're just worried about the metrics. So then I need to get to the deeper route, which is talking to the employees at hand and like really feeling their environment and walking around and seeing how do the leaders interact with them. And so we do employee engagement surveys because I never want an employer to take my word for it. I always want them to hear firsthand what their people think and say. Mm. And so that's why we start with the employee engagement survey. And that usually gives them all of the information that they need And then I can tell them, okay, great. Based on this feedback, here are some steps that you can implement immediately. So the next six months you're growing and you're going to see an increase. You're retaining your people. You're going to see everything start to shift. And then in a year, you're really going to see your revenue start to skyrocket and you're going to see your retention increase. And then you're going to see client satisfaction. So therefore you're likely going to grow. You're going to onboard more people and you're going to have a process. So you're not just winging it. It's going to be standard. (laughs) Yeah. That's usually like the initial conversation in that first 30 minutes of let's do a quick culture audit. Nice. Nice. Now a culture audit for people that may not know much about that. What does that mean? Yeah. So that's where I go into their company and I, I, typically ask like a series of questions, simple, similar to what I was just saying, but Mm -hmm. I just gauge the temperature one, how knowledgeable is the leader and not saying they're not knowledgeable as in smart, but like knowledgeable as in the day to day, like how immersed are they in the actual tasks that are happening at hand? Or are they just behind that Excel sheet where they're really just looking at numbers and crunching numbers? Because you really have to see your people and you have to see the environment and how people are interacting with each other to know the difference. And so that's what the audit is really like you and I sitting down for 30 minutes. I'm going to ask you a series of questions based on your answers. I'm going to analyze and then I'm going to say, this is what I believe to be happening within your organization. Again, this is just my outside perception. I can't tell you everything that's going on, but that will give you a starting point of if you try maybe these two to three things over the next six months, you're going to see an improvement and they usually do. And so that's really what that is. It's just giving an overview of this is what I'm seeing. That's, that's a barrier in your organization. And I typically only stay with the three elements. So communication, connection, and relationships. Those are like my three things that I swear by, if those three things are great, then your business is going to thrive. Love that. Yeah. Okay. In terms of connection, like what do you feel is missing an organization if they don't have that connection piece? What specifically from the organization or company? Yeah. Yeah. Usually it's just the lack of conversation, the lack of like actually getting to know people. A lot of times what I see is people come in and it's very process oriented. So it's very reward and discipline. You come in, you do your job and there's not much relationship building. You're not Mm -hmm. really connecting with other people. Like maybe you have a couple of people that you talk to in the break room, but that's the extent of what you do. But maybe you and your supervisor don't really know each other. Maybe you don't have the conversation. And the only time that you talk to that person is when you've done something wrong or you, you have haven't met your KPIs or you haven't fulfilled whatever your expectation was. So then they're coming to you to tell you, talk to you about all of the negative things versus, Hey, like you did a great job, like hitting your sales this week or great try on this. I know that we coached about X, Y, and Z last week. And I see that you were really trying to improve amazing. And so it's just really having those, those connections, but I always say connection happens in the hallway. So you can tell by how people walk. If, if somebody's walking by with their head down, maybe looking at their phone, not paying attention to anybody walking by, that's a good indication that there's not much connection going on in your building. Mm, That's a good one. What are some other ones in terms of relationships like that you've noticed? Yeah. Yeah. So relationships really, I think come after that connections, maybe the conversation is only strictly 
business. Like you don't know anything about your people. Maybe you don't even know your team's names. And I think that's such a simple thing. Most people will strive to at least know somebody's name, but taking it a step further and saying, I'm walking down the hall. Hey, Sarah, oh my gosh, I'm so excited for this weekend. Like we get a little time off. Do you have any big plans? And maybe you're telling me about a vacation that's coming up and, and you're excited to go do this. And then on Monday, I'm going to follow up when I see you again and be like, oh my gosh, how was that? How was your vacation? I knew that you were taking a small trip. Mm -hmm. I know you're so excited about it. Tell me a little bit. I'm excited to hear. And then you feel more connected to me one, because I remembered that you were taking a, a small vacation over the weekend. And two, that I actually followed up and took the time to say, Hey, like I cared about you enough to want to have this conversation and really yes. see how it impacted you. And then you get to talk about something that you were excited about. And then you likely will go do the same thing with somebody else. And it mm -hmm. just trickles throughout the organization. Yeah. And just in, in general, building the relationships is yeah. something that you don't get much of, especially when people are working hybrid or remote. It can be very difficult to sustain those relationships, but taking the time to really just get to know people, even if it's one little thing, makes such an impact. And like you said, it trickles into the rest of the organization. Yeah. So there was a third one. You said connection. You had relationships and was the third one, communication and communication. And just when you, like you said, when people are like staring down at their phones or not interacting, that can be a big indicator. Yeah. And even, I, I think even communication sometimes is like, what is my expectation of you? And am I actually communicating that with you? If I'm not satisfied with your work or are we having these conversations? If I am satisfied, am I telling you? But a lot of times we have a hard time saying when somebody's maybe not meeting what we need and they don't know. So like we, we have that barrier mm. of communication. And so it's as simple as having daily check-ins or if you have morning meetings to icebreakers so that it like releases the tension. And then you're able, when I'm more relaxed and somebody gives me feedback, I'm more open to actually receive it. So it's just like those little things in communication. Totally. Yeah. It's that. And uh, body language too is I know a huge thing that you and I've talked about in the past. Like when you noticed, like you, you mentioned about the head going down, but there's so many other things like people crossing their arms in a meeting, people staring off in the distance, zoning out, like body language can also be a great indicator for the, the employees, the employers too. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. I even, <laughs> I have to be conscious of it. Even with my children, I think of that and I'm like, okay, I'm saying one thing, but how am I presenting? Sometimes I'm like, all right, hurry up. We got to do X, Y, and Z. But I'm like, I, my tone might sound calm, but they're like, oh, mom's not calm. Like she's not ready for this. So it's, it's really being aware of all of that. And I think that comes with emotional intelligence and, and how willing are we to develop our people in that skill too. That's when I don't think that we, we really teach enough. And, and I think we need more of that. Yeah. I, I know you work with a lot of executive women. And when you said about children and everything, I was like, oh, this is something that a lot of my listeners will really want to dig deeper into the corporate culture around maternity leave, paternity leave. Like that is a huge problem right now. Like not having enough time with your kid or feeling like you have to take all 12 week unpaid yeah. for a lot of companies. There are some that are like on board and excited and they're feeling like they have to put their kids now in these daycares Anyway, what kind of approach do you feel companies need to have when it comes to broaching the subject about maternity and paternity leave? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So many thoughts on this. I think first off, I think that we could be a little bit more compassionate, right? It's easy to box us up and put us in a category because like we're carrying the child and we have that maternal connection, but it's really more than that. It's almost like I think of it as 12 weeks is not enough with your child, right? Like in, in having that stress in your mind of, okay, we have 12 weeks, but then the stress of I'm not getting paid for 12 weeks. So am I actually fully present with my child or am I already thinking about the, the strain that maybe it's putting on the household or what is that going to look like for daycare, which in itself is a huge expense. So it's like, how can we tweak these things? And maybe it's like after 12 weeks that we bring back a part-time 
opportunity, or maybe there's some bonuses that we can give, or maybe there's like vouchers, or maybe we could actually talk about what does paid leave look like? What does yeah. that look like? Even if it's like a smaller percent of the check, it doesn't have to be 100%, but in actuality, like that's going to motivate people to want to give back to the company. I know that would motivate me to want to come back even a little bit, but if I had the opportunity to work at home so I could still have the connection with my child and be paid, maybe I'm not there full time, but like mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of different options or like I've seen some organizations where they open daycares. And I know that there's like a lot of liabilities there and things like that, that we could talk about logistically, but having the options or at least the conversation to say you're important and you matter, I think is definitely an area that we're lacking and, and we could truly do better in so many aspects. Yeah, we yeah. truly could do better. We could be doing more. Uh, I feel that a lot of the times just based on the corporate women that I have worked with is they feel that their energy is like being pulled in so many different directions. They feel like actually rushed to come back sooner because they're also worried about their job security. Even though you get 12 weeks and stuff, what happens when you come back? And maybe Jan over there, she's doing a great job covering for some of your, your time away, which is great. But maybe then she's going to take your job. Like there's all these fears that start to take over. Yeah, no, I so agree. And unfortunately, like we, we've actually seen it happen. And and so like, I, I think the fear is there because it's been set that like, Hey, this is a possibility. And I, it's really unfortunate. Like I'm thinking about all of these movies and I'm thinking about what, like when I was on maternity leave and like those being thoughts of, okay, I got to get back. And when I get back, am I going to be as good as I was before? And because we are, our bodies are physically going through so much, right? Like I, I had brain fog for, I feel like years after. Yeah. And, and it's like, how do we get back to 100% when one, we're rushed, when two, we're super stressed out at all of the external things and the fact that then we can't even fully be present with our child creates a lot of shame and creates a lot of guilt. And then we have to try and go back and, and be that a leader and like really step into our masculine energy and how can we hit all of the numbers and, and <laughs> be that go-getter. There's just so many components to that. Yeah, so much. With your executive women that you coach, what are some like foundational steps that you feel you need to take with them to get out of their head? Not just like fear of if, if they are moms, if they're not moms, but that fear of losing or yeah, losing everything, losing their job or not being good enough. Like all these things that come into our brains when that fight or flight takes over. Yeah. So I, the primary thing that I see is burnout. It's the constant, you try to do everything that you can because you don't feel that you're good enough and you could wake up tomorrow and it's going to be taken away from you. So I really have to help them get back to the ground, right? Get back to, and be rooted in what it is like, this is who you are as a person. Like you're naturally good at these things. You've strived to get there. But the one thing that I see often is that we become the go-getter. We become the yes woman, the one who says, I will take on everything and no, I won't ever give it away because I know if I do, I'm not valued. But really, we're actually devaluing ourselves when we do that because there's no way that we can handle a thousand things. And so it's like really bringing them back to the reprogramming, like when you initially took on all of this, you were proving something, but now you've already proved it. So how do we get you from here and get you up to here where you actually want to go? And so that looks like building your bench. That looks like mentoring people and help. Like we bring other people up so that we can then move up more, right? If we never teach somebody else in our place to take over the things that we were doing, we can never move forward. We're always going to be held back. Mm. And then we have resentment and we have all of these feelings of it's because I'm not good enough, but truly it's because we put ourselves in this box of, I have to do it all where I'm not valued. Um, and so what I teach them how to do is to create resilient teams to where they can then do all of the work without them. If we had fully functioning teams, 
say everybody in your marketing department knew how to do all of the marketing jobs, right? <laughs> There's no scarcity there because everybody's, I know how to do your job, even though you know how to do my job. So we create everybody as an equal. And then if somebody's not there, great. We have five other people that are picking up that slack. It's not on one person. And then if the leader's not there, right? Say she's, I just want to spend time with my family and I've got a two-week vacation in Greece that I want to go to. It sounds great. I'd love to go there. Then she can when her phone's not blowing up because she's the only person who knows how to do it. And so it's reteaching those things because when we first get into corporate, it's so true that we do, we have to grind and we have to hustle. And there is no doubt in my mind that if we didn't do that, we likely wouldn't be seen to get to that position. And that's just, unfortunate facts. But when we do get to that point, that's when we have to say, okay, like this is enough. And now to move forward, we then have to bring others with us. So that way we can continue to progress and we're not burning ourselves out because people come to me when they're at the point of burnout, which is so sad. Yeah, it is so sad. And let's be straight up. Like when we are in burnout, we don't have any clarity. We don't know what's going on. We don't know our right hand from our left hand. It's brain fog galore times, times a thousand. Like we can't be productive if we're not able to let go of some of the stuff. Like I, for many years, I had a fitness business and it was all me. And the problem was my clients wouldn't go to anyone else. They would not seek assistance from anyone else. Like they had to get an answer from me. And although I loved that they felt so trusted or I'm sorry, comforted by my trainings and all the things, it also was like, okay, it's a crutch. And as I started to build my business, I was like, okay, I have to let some of you go. I want you to experience these other amazing instructors that were trained under the same program as me, because that art of letting go is actually doing a service to them because it's teaching them how to spread their wings and grow. And now I'm always up for collaboration and partnerships. That's why I love doing these podcasts with people that are so well-versed in corporate culture and like you just... Yeah, you're a ray of sunshine. And I'm just so grateful that you're doing the work you're doing. How, you're welcome. How on earth though, can you get people that are more pigheaded and stuck in their ways to reconfigure their thought patterns? Yeah, I usually, uh, (laughs) so I have so many stories because that that was me. I was like, yeah, no, I have to do it all (laughs) until my body physically broke down. It was, it it fought me. And it was like, if you don't stop, then I'm going to take you out. And it, it was a really harsh reality. And it did. I ended up with Bell's policy and I had to, I was like two weeks and I was fighting the doctor. I was like, I have to work. I can't not. And she just, she looked at me and she was like, do you want this as your reality forever? Mm. And I was like, No. And she was like, great. Then two weeks is minimum. She's you're lucky that you're even here. Like my thyroid is gone, like all of these things. And and if I would have known before, if I would have just taken a little bit of time, if I would have allowed other people to help be resources and allow me to, and them, me allowed to, to develop them and mentor them, life could have actually been better and easier. And now like reflecting back, I'm like, Oh, I missed a lot of things because I was stubborn. And so I take them through a pretty harsh visualization. Some have children, some don't. So if they don't, it's okay. Do you know, do you want to see yourself 10 years from now in that corner office, still doing the same thing that you're doing broken down, not satisfied. Maybe you're making all the money in the world, right? But what are you doing with it? You're in this office. You don't spend any of it. You don't go on trips. You don't see friends. You probably don't even have friends at this point. I was like, you've avoided relationships because you've been married to your position, or maybe you've had relationships that didn't work out. And it, people are like, you do that with your, but I'm like, it sounds like a really harsh reality, but that's what becomes reality. If we don't actually take the steps to relearn what it is that we're doing and depending on the person. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, depending on the person, it might be health issues that they're like, this is what I'm experiencing, or it could be family, it could be a lack of family, it could be lack of relationships or travel or enjoyment. And so, yeah, I really just bring them down. Is this the reality that you would, you want? So are, are you saying it's to sit in a dark office by yourself? That's the reality you're working for. And that's usually when it clicks of, 
no, that's not what I want. <laughs> this is not yeah. what I want. I want so much more with my life yeah. and relationships, recognizing that, wow, all these relationships that I had built, maybe it was just work and you want so much more than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the end of the day, our families, our friends, those are the ones that are here for us. So mm -hmm. we want to go our whole life, like not being with them because I don't, I, I did do that for quite a while. And there's so much I regret. There's so much I missed out on and that I can never get back. And so I can only move forward with the intention that that's not going to be me again. And how do I set clear boundaries and speak my expectations of other people and myself and hold myself accountable and have them hold me accountable too. Yeah. And one of our most valuable assets is time and being able to enjoy and spend time with our loved ones. Something that why I do what I do. And I know that for you, what you do is because we both have lost people in our lives and it has impacted us greatly. And yeah. I know that you went through a lot. I, I see seeing you and being authentic and sharing has been a, a wonderful journey for other people to watch for me as someone that has lost someone. So I know that I just wanted to throw that out there for you. Like it is seen and honoring his memory is so yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. A thousand percent. And I think that's a huge perception change of what's truly important. Like we only have the right now. We're not guaranteed 10 minutes from now. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. And at the end of the day, am I satisfied with the time that I've spent with the people that are most important to me? Yeah. Yeah. Cause we can't get that back. Mm -mm. You know, if, if you were still alive today, what would be one thing that you would want to say getting some of your time back with him. Is there anything that you would want to say to him? Oh, <laughs> so, so many things. It's just one thing that's so hard. I would, I don't even know if it would be saying anything. It would just be, yes, let's do those family dinners. Yes. Come over and let's play video games or let's play board games. Let's laugh until we can't anymore. Let's reminisce about all of the crazy things of when we were kids or like a few years ago, what that looked like. Let's take that trip that we said that we were, we wanted to plan later on. Just, I would say yes to all of the things that I thought I would have later to do that I didn't. It's important. And what's something that I have found and every year is different. So I will preface that, but uh, the year after my dad's passing, we took the trip that I knew my dad would love. And it was like, we went to the Dominican Republic, my mom and I, and it was one of the most magical experiences because I just sat on the beach, read my book, did an activity that I knew my dad would love. <laughs> And he's always with you is what I'm getting at. And he'll always be there for you when you need it. Uh, that's so special. I'm so glad that you got to do that. And with your mom, I think that's even more yeah. special to be able to share. That with her. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, and we live in Florida now. And I was like, <laughs> you must be <laughs> kicking yourself. <laughs> you love the beaches and everything. Yeah. It's yeah. something to remember guys is when you are, working day in and day out. Remember your why. Why do you work? Why do you care so much about what you're doing? If the answer is you don't care, then what you do, dig deeper and ask yourself, what should you be doing? Yeah, definitely. Always, every single day. Is this what my time should be doing? Yeah. Like, <laughs> the why is so important. And I hear often, especially with the women I work with, I do it for my family. And I'm like, when's the last time you sat down intentionally with your family? And that's a really hard question. And mm. that's one. And it's not because I say it to be mean, but it, it was a question I had to ask myself. And I was like, yeah, I said that they are the most important thing to me, yet they seem to be the last to get my time. Mm. And that's a, again, it's just a really hard reality to to think about and to remember, but 
we've got to think about those things because if we don't, then we just keep doing the same patterns. And then we have people in the background that are waiting patiently. Yeah. How did you break the pattern? So it really, I honestly, I really do owe it all to that two weeks after I had Bell's palsy. It was, it was an eye opener that my employer actually was like, so when are you coming back? We need you. And I was like, okay, but like my doctor said, and half of my face is paralyzed. I don't like, I can't do anything. Like I can't be stressed. Like I can't be in that environment right now. And it wasn't like, are you okay? And I felt this weird pressure of, I need to, here's documentation. Like as if I was going to lie about something like that, this is how I felt inside. And I just knew that the people that cared about me were my family, the ones showing up for me. Are you okay, mom? Can we do this? And my husband was taking care of me and like making dinner and just like really making sure that I wasn't stressed. So that way I could work this out of my system and, and like really reverse the effects. And the fact that my employer was so concerned about my, like me showing up and my attendance really just proved to me that I've had it all wrong. I've had it all wrong this entire time. And so I made a promise. I I just said, all right, Alexis, like when we go back, it's going to be different. Mm. And it was, and, and it, it wasn't liked, it wasn't, it was a very hard thing to go back to, but I stuck to it. I did. And I was really proud of that. And my family was proud of that, but it's hard. It's not easy. Like I can't even sit here and say that it's an easy thing to do because work is ingrained in me. It's ingrained in your listeners. We're high achievers. We love to work. We love what we do, but it comes at a cost. And so what are you willing to pay? Mm -hmm. How has stress saved your life? Yeah, it's made me stop it. And not because I wanted to, but because it's physically made me stop. And I am pretty convinced after talking to my doctors that like, if I wouldn't have, I either would have been high risk for stroke or heart attack. And it's just not listening to that. I wouldn't be here. I would not be here right now. I'm so grateful that you came on. This is a lovely conversation. How can people connect with you? outside of this interview. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. You can find me on LinkedIn or Instagram, Alexis M Carpenter. And that's my name on both of them. Yeah. And my podcast will be coming out relaunching at the end of February. So I'm excited. That's (laughs) awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. That's going to be amazing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then some fun things coming for 2025. I know like we're in the beginning of 2024, but I'm already thinking about these women that are just like in this phase of their life. And they're like, I I want and need more. How do I change that? I have something for you. So I'm so excited for that more to come. So exciting. I'm, I can't wait. I'm definitely probably one of those women that's going to need it. (laughs) Oh, Thank you so much. And guys, please share your takeaways, what you enjoyed, connect with Alexis. Obviously she's great and has such a wonderful, genuine heart. That's why I really connected with her in the first place was we both are just heart centered people and feel a lot. (laughs) So please connect. And as always, remember to be kind on your self-love journey and have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thanks to Dan Lieber at Beckett Brown Music for the intro and outro music. You can keep in touch with me on Instagram at Sarah Elise Coaching. If you're looking to improve your health and wellness, check out my business, livewellenhanceyou.com. While you're there, join the Live Well Enhance You email list and receive exclusive offers for our wellness programs and events. Until next time, take care.